Hi, this is the first video on applications of Gauss's law. So you have looked at Gauss's law and how it makes intuitive sense. That when you look at the electric charge as being the source of electric field, that electric flux is in some sense conserved. Graphically, this is easiest to see in an electric field line diagram. The electric field lines come out of a positive charge and it can either go out to infinity or end on a negative charge. And this quantity here, electric field times the area, is in some sense counting those electric field lines going through a particular area. So once you have, a, for example, a positive charge and you have a surface defined that's enclosing that positive charge, then this uh, electric flux, number of electric field lines going out of the surface really only depends on the amount of charge that's enclosed. It doesn't depend on anything else. Now, what takes more work is seeing how this is useful because we don't usually care about quantity like a flux. It doesn't really relate to anything that you would measure physically. So it's a question of what is Gauss's law good for? A lot of what we do in electrostatics is trying to find electric field. Gauss's law has electric field in it, so it looks like it might be useful in finding electric field. But the challenge here is that this is inside an integral. As you might remember from your calculus class, when you have an unknown function inside an integral, it's really difficult to solve for that unknown function. So as far as applications of Gauss's law goes, what will be really important will be symmetry. Because if you have symmetry, this is what we might be able to do. We might be able to make an argument that this electric field is constant over some area we are dealing with, and then we can pull this out of the integral, thereby avoiding the need to do any actual integral and solve for the electric field. So here's the good news. With the applications of Gauss's law, there will really only be three types of symmetry where you can actually exploit uh, that kind of uniformity to pull the electric field out of the integral and be actually able to solve for the value of the electric field. And we'll go over all three examples. That's what this and the next two videos are about. So in this first video, I want to look at the spherical symmetry. If you remember the other lecture videos, you might remember the sphere example being the most difficult example. Now with the Gauss's law, the exact opposite is true. Spherical symmetry actually represents the simplest kind of symmetry. This is where we have rotational symmetry in all three dimensions. So this is what a sphere looks like. You've seen it. And this is what we mean it's uh, rotationally symmetric. When we take a sphere and we rotate it, nothing changes. And you can do this for three different axes, which is what I mean by rotational symmetry in 3D. This symmetry, when you have it, gives us a very strong argument for simplifying the expressions involving Gauss's law. So let's get started. Let me use the simplest possible example of uniformly charged sphere. So suppose I have a sphere of charge and it carries a uniform charge density rho naught, a constant. So this is a spherical symmetric. You can take this, rotate it around any kind of axis and nothing changes. And we'll see soon just how useful this fact is. Let's say this sphere of charge has radius r. The question we are most interested in here is what is the electric field? 
And in a sense, it's going to depend on the distance from the sphere. So as a function of distance r from the sphere. So let's take a point outside the sphere that is at this distance r. For this case, we can say that this lowercase r is greater than the radius of a sphere. And we have done this calculation before, last time using integral. And this time we are going to somehow try to use Gauss's law to answer this same question. And the first thing about Gauss's law is that it involves an area integral over a closed surface. So we are going to need to define a surface. We call this surface Gaussian surface. It doesn't correspond to any physical object. It's just a mathematical surface over which we are going to do this integral or pretend to do this integral. So since we want to find the electric field at this point, we better define a surface that includes this point here. And the key to choosing a useful Gaussian surface is to choose a surface that follows the symmetry of the setup. Here we have a spherical symmetry, so we should choose a spherical surface that includes this point. So let me draw that. All right, here's the spherical surface that contains that point. So it's a sphere of radius r. Now, with this spherical surface, this is the argument we can make. We can say that the electric field at this point here is going to be the same as electric field magnitude at this point here. Because this is what we are imagining. Take a sphere with this dot here, and we can do what we call symmetry operation. We can apply a rotation operation that's going to take this point to appear. And when we do that, with this system, nothing changes because this charge distribution is spherically symmetric. The rotation changes nothing, which means the electric field also shouldn't change. So this is the gist of that symmetry argument. And let me add in this detail of the area element. So from when we cover the electric flux, you know that with the area element, we assign a vector direction so that the vector direction points perpendicular to the surface. So at this point, when we look at e dot dA, we are looking at the dot product between the electric field and this area element dA. And we can come up with a symmetry argument that will let us say that the electric field must point in the same direction as dA, radially outward. This is the argument. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that our electric field somehow doesn't point radially. It some goes in weird direction. Then this is the symmetry operation we can consider. We can imagine reflecting it over a line connecting from center to that point. And when we reflect it over, what it would do is it would change this electric field so that it points this way. But part of the spherical symmetry here is that when you do that reflection, the charge distribution doesn't change. So this change of electric field is absurd. It's a contradictory, which is why we call this proof by contradiction. The thing that we started assuming leads us into contradiction, which means what we assumed must be false. So instead of assuming that our electric field can point in some direction like this, we have to undo that assumption and say that the only direction electric field can point in is in the radial direction. So that when you do the reflection operation, the electric field doesn't change either. So this argument that I sketched out here, the combination of two things, that the magnitude of electric field must be constant over this entire surface. And moreover, electric field must be parallel to the area element dA simplifies this integral a lot. Let's see. So we have E dot dA, but we know electric field is always parallel to dA. 
So this dot product becomes just a product of the two magnitudes, E and DA. And we just made the argument how over the entire sphere, the electric field is constant. So I can pull the electric field out of the integral to give us electric field time integral of dA over the sphere. Well, that's just the surface area of a sphere. Hopefully you have that formula memorized. Surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r here, lowercase r, because that's the radius of the Gaussian surface you are looking at. I want you to see how quickly the left-hand side simplified into this simple algebraic formula. We don't know actual integral at all. And what we can now say is that this left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. So this is equal to charge enclosed multiplied by all these constants, 4 pi times Coulomb's constant. And we can solve for the electric field. Electric field is equal to charge enclosed. The 4 pi is cancel, so times Ke, Coulomb's constant over r squared. This should look familiar because this was Coulomb's law. Now what's different here is Coulomb's law was for point charges. This is electric field of a sphere outside of the sphere. I hope this reminds you of a result that we are using in physics 4a without derivation. That gravitational effect of a spherical body you can calculate that by treating the sphere as if it's all concentrated at the center of the sphere. This calculation is the proof why. Um, in anticipation of the next case we are going to look at, we can change the parameters for our answer here because we are given the uniform density instead of the total charge. And this is a pretty simple calculation. The charge density is the amount of charge divided by the volume of the sphere. So charge enclosed or charge in the sphere is just the density times volume. And hopefully you have this memorized. Volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And here I want to use the correct r. I, want, I need to use the radius of the sphere, not the Gaussian surface. So plugging this in for charge enclosed yields this result. Electric field of the sphere on the outside is 4 pi coulombs r cubed, the density of the sphere, divided by 3 r squared. Well, this doesn't look any simpler, but as I said, I'm anticipating the next case we are going to look at. So we found the electric field of spherically uniform charge distribution. But this is only a special case of where the point is outside the sphere. Now, what if the point is within the sphere? So we would be looking at, for example, this point here. Let me call that B. How would we calculate the electric field at point B? And the steps we go through is remarkably similar to what we just went through. So the first thing we do is define the Gaussian surface that contains that point and honors the symmetry of the system. So that's going to be another sphere. Sphere of radius r. This time, this radius is less than the radius of the charged sphere. All right, let's step through the calculation we did. The left-hand side of Gauss's law, calculating the flux. The symmetry argument we made before continues to hold. So none of these steps are changing. All right, so this left-hand side, it remains the same. Um, the flux is electric field times 4 pi r squared, the area of the Gaussian surface. So what changes? What changes here is the charge enclosed. You can see it in the picture here. I'm leaving a bunch of charge on the outside. So I have to put in the correct value of charge enclosed 
to get the correct result here. So let's look back at how we calculated the charge enclosed. It was charge density times volume. So before I used the volume of the whole sphere using the radius capital R. Now this time what I hope you see is that we want the volume of only that enclosed within the Gaussian surface because that's the only charge that's enclosed. Outside the Gaussian surface, these are not charges enclosed. So we can include them. So going back through the derivation, ah, there it is. Instead of capital R cubed, I would put in lowercase r cubed. That's the radius of our Gaussian surface. So plugging that in for Q enclosed, I get instead of capital R cubed, lowercase r cubed. And that actually leads to some interesting cancellation. I still have this uh, lowercase r squared from calculating the flux on the left hand side and then moving it over. So this is going to cancel out two of the factors here, leaving us with this result. It's a remarkable result. It says simply that the magnitude of electric field inside the sphere it goes linearly as the distance from the center of the sphere. So when you're at the very center, the electric field is zero. When you hear that, it probably makes a sense. I hope it makes sense. And go farther and farther out, the electric field increases up until the point you reach the surface of the sphere. After you reach the surface of the sphere, then the electric field decreases as inverse square. So that's the result. So with these two results, I know the electric field over the entire space around the spherically uniform charge distribution. And that's our result. I want you to notice how much simpler this was compared to the integral calculation that I did last week. That took 30 minutes. I had to use Mathematica. Here, all this was very simple. And if you've been paying attention to the argument, it is mathematically rigorous. I have taken no shortcut, no hand-waving arguments that cannot withstand the scrutiny. Before we move on to the next example, I want to look at one significant result that I just mentioned in passing, but I want to highlight it so that you will remember it the next time you need to use it. Let me clean up the figure a little bit here. Now, this time, instead of saying uniformly charged sphere, let's say we are dealing with a uniformly charged spherical shell. So all the charge is sitting on the shell here, and it's uniformly distributed. And I think if we ask for the electric field outside, you can get this result in the same way we just did the calculation. You can go through the same calculation for radius greater than the radius of the sphere, and I hope you can walk through that on your own. Now, here's the place where it gets interesting. Let me ask, what is the electric field inside the spherical shell? All right, so that means we define a Gaussian surface here, a sphere of some radius that contains the point that I'm interested in, possibly. And when you go through this argument, you are going to see that the charge enclosed is equal to zero because it doesn't enclose any charge. And here's the power of the symmetry argument. Nothing on the left-hand side here changes. So I can say when the enclosed charge is zero, you can say looking at the rest of the equation that the electric field must be equal to zero. So here, we can say that the electric field here is equal to zero. And this is not a statement that you can make every time. We went through carefully how you could have zero flux and yet have non-zero electric field because flux is integral and you can have a non-zero integrand that integrates to zero. 
So what I'm telling you now is that when you have high enough degree of symmetry, like this is spherical symmetry, you can say that when your flux is zero, the electric field is zero also, because there's this step where we are able to take the electric field out. So at this point, if you are still saying that the flux is zero, then well, electric field has to be zero. So this is the result that I wanted to highlight for you that electric field inside a uniformly charged shell is equal to zero. So the derivation is uh, interesting. If we had to do this by integral, I can tell you that it would have taken a lot of work and would have been very difficult. With the Gauss's law, it's a very simple argument we had to go through to be able to claim this very broad statement. And the second thing is, this arrangement is surprisingly common. Whenever you have a conducting sphere and you put some charge on it, the charges are going to spread out in a uniform fashion. So when we get to conductors and we are dealing with the spherical conductors, I hope you remember this fact so that you know that electric field inside a uniformly charged spherical shell will be zero. Alright, so that's everything I have for the spherical symmetry. In the next video, we'll look at uh, cylindrical symmetry.